Have you ever wondered why some guys tag out every year? What's their secrets to success? That's exactly what we're going to talk about on our show tonight. You're not going to want to miss it. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk, and they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Welcome to Elk Bros. This is Big G Ornellis here in the house. We got Joe Gillia, Leroy Chav Chavez with us. Uh, these guys are are the founders and the and the focal point of Elk Bros. We want to thank you guys for being with us tonight here on Elk Bros. And uh, tell us a little something about yourselves. People want to learn about elk hunting. We love elk hunting. And that's going to be Elk Bros. We're here. We're, we're the blue collar guys that want to take those people. It don't matter if they have never hunted elk before and they're just interested to hunt it. That's or right. if they, like yourself, have been hunting elk for a long time, but you want to find ways to be more successful. No, no doubt. There's really a lot we could talk about tonight. But I think some of the things that, you know, we want to talk about in the episode are three or four focus areas that really make you guys successful in what, what we do. We got a pretty good track record going. Uh, I'll let Joe tell you what his track record is and how many elk he's killed over the last 30 plus years. Um, I know I, I, I wished I would have started a lot younger. Uh, this is definitely a young man's game, but what's so cool is to watch Chav out walk all of us every day. So I know I got plenty of uh, elk, elk hunts left in me, that's for sure. So can't wait to spend more time with you guys in the elk woods. But those are the things we want to discuss tonight is three or four real key things for us to be successful when we get, when we get started in the, in the woods together. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, when I think back to when Chav and I first started doing this, I was, well, when I started hunting this, I was 19, 20 years old. I think I killed my first elk when I was 21. And uh, I think it's been 33 out of the last 35 years that. Uh, Ooh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, at least. Yeah, that's uh, public land stuff too, brother. That's yeah, not public hunting land. in a cage anywhere. No. But see, it, you know, that's one of the things when we start talking about some of the, the, the three things that we're going to talk about now, yeah, yeah. I, I want people to understand something, though, is, you know, my history, Chav's history, when you, when you look back and you're a college student or you're just working in your first jobs as a teacher, boy, we, <laughs> teachers and coaches don't make that much. So, for sure, you know, when we were hunting then – we never thought about not filling our tag. That wasn't an option. Yeah. <laughs> we want to eat. <laughs> we, yeah, we're for gonna sure. Put, yeah, mama said, PB and J. <laughs> <laughs> mama says, if you're going to spend that money, you better bring something home, right? For sure. I, I resemble yeah. that remark for sure. Right. So, you know, that's one thing that in all of these years, you know, Chab and I, people out there don't know. So, Leroy Chavez and I are married to sisters. And uh, first time we met was when I, when I got engaged to my wife and, and I got introduced to the family. And, and there's two things that happened in my life to totally change my life. And that's the fact that Chav here was a head track coach and I wasn't, I was a hunter. <laughs> right, right. He introduced me to track and field and I introduced him to hunting. And there was a point in time when both of those things came together. We've hunted together now for 37 years, I 37 think. 37 years. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we coached together for a lot of number of years. He was my mentor in coaching. And uh, I was his mentor in hunting. And it kind of crossed over that now he lives 200 yards down the road. And, that's so and we awesome. started doing that together and uh you know it's been 
it's been a great deal because he's not just my brother-in-law. And that's the thing, you know, you hear, you know, when you talk to me, when the other guys from our elk camp come in and we talk, we refer to each other as brother. And that's, for sure. that's why we named this elk bros, you know, love it. No, I, I, it's perfect. You know, when I first saw it, I thought, man, there's nothing, you can't name it anything better. You know, I feel that way every day when I'm in elk camp, I'm with my brothers. So, and that's the exact thing right there. See, Gilbert, what you just said is the whole goal of this is almost like we're inviting people into our camp. For sure. And all I know how to do, I've coached for 30 some years. This guy coached for 30 some. Well, I don't know. He might have been pushing even more than that. Maybe about 40. About 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm a coach. He's a coach. I'm a hunter. Uh, We've we've done things in those fields to be very successful. And our goal is to coach those people out there that want to learn about elk hunting and or want to become better elk hunters. Now, uh, we're both bow hunters. I'm a professional guide. I guide rifle hunters all during the year. So even though the rifle is not my weapon of choice, uh, I have a lot of experience around that. So uh, with that, uh, those people that want to find about, out about elk bros, go over to elk bros, um, take a look at what we have on the site, take a look at our Blue Collar Elk Academy, because that's where we have the uh, we have a subscription-based content there. There's going to be a lot of free content. You're going to be able to see our podcast. You'll see us on YouTube. But go and check out if you want to really get a load of information. You can go to our uh, our Blue Collar Elk Academy, and there's nothing that we don't know that's going to be on there. Yeah, or, or nothing that's going to come, crop up that you guys hadn't had to endure. Right. I mean, I've been hunting with you for nine years and you guys both are fantastic coaches. I, you know, I've been successful because of the coaches that I've had. Right. Some here with us and some passed on. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, I can't thank God enough for both of you guys to be in my life. And y'all changed my life. You know, when I first showed up on the mountain 10 years, nine years ago, you know, I weighed 335, 340 pounds, you know, this morning when I woke up, I'm 258. So yes, I mean, sir, brother, uh, that's it. You know, Great. It's uh, it's getting better every day. When I show back up to elk camp this year, I got a goal of 235 and uh, y'all won't, y'all think I'm too skinny when I show up. That's for sure. <laughs> well, man, that means you'll be on the heels then we're going to be chasing. For sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> and uh, you know, one thing that I want people to understand too is, is, you know, the type of content we're putting out there is, you know, what camo, all the different gear and different things. And we've had to do it. We're Walmart shoppers, man. We've had to do it the tough way. Um, I've got, I still have gear my wife has made for me. So, you know, we're going to show people how they can do this, do it right, but they're able to do it affordably to whatever they can afford. For sure, man. And, uh, you know, uh, we love when somebody gives us a gift that's uh, a real nice jacket or something like that. And now that we're older and, and stuff, we can get a few more, you know, a few more items and stuff, but we've been there. We've been sleeping out of the back of the truck. We've been sleeping on the ground. We've been hunting in snow and. <laughs> right. Yeah. In 37 years, we've kind of hunted in every type of weather condition, you know, drought, heavy rain, even a little snow every once in a while. So we encountered it, encountered it all. So And still to this day, and you can attest that, Gilbert, my rain gear is a poncho. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. Ain't no Gore-Tex in that pack. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's get back to what we were talking about and take these people to what they wanted to hear. And uh, we're going to talk about three focus areas that uh, we think are the main reasons for the success that we've had over the years. And uh, the first one that, that I want to talk about as a coach is the same thing that I talk to each one of my athletes every year, man. And that's attitude. No doubt. You know, when I first started hunting, like I said, not filling my tag, that's, that wasn't an option. Yeah. My attitude going into the woods, I can tell you every time I walk into the woods with my bow, I truly believe, you buddy, I truly believe I'm going to take an elk. Yeah. You know, that, that's, 
okay, so the experience is incredible. The For relationships sure. are incredible. The, the ties that we make with each other as hunting buddies and so on, it's awesome, you know. But I hear a lot of people these days saying, well, you know, success to me isn't getting an animal necessarily. It's all about the hunt. Well, let me right. tell you what, it's all about the hunt with this boy too. For sure. But if I am successful at my hunt, I'm putting meat in my freezer. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we eat it. I mean, look, I, my kids could care less about eating beef, right? I mean, we eat venison and we eat elk meat every year. If I'm fortunate enough to to be able to come hunt with you guys, I've been really fortunate the last six, seven years in a row, and uh, we've done some incredible things with some extraordinary circumstances, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I feel feel the same way. Not every time are you going to go out – and kill an elk, but you should feel like every time you're out there, you can, right? right? And you feel like you have the tools to make it happen. But it all starts 100% with just like what you and Chad were saying is your attitude, right? And there's things that you can do to to make sure that you have that because For attitude sure. is, it's confidence. For sure. And, you know, there's things that we do to be able to, to improve that, to, mm. to feel like we can go in those woods. And off season encounters. Now, a lot of guys can't do that. We live up here in the mountains. Uh, mm. We live at the base of the Sangres here, and and we get a chance to go out shed hunting. And we're looking forward mm. to that already. Right. right. Got a, some shed hunting expeditions planned <laughs> here pretty soon. And right. when we go out in the off season, we have encounters with elk. You know, we're always getting up close to elk. And the more that you can do that, even without a bow in your hand, the more than you're going to feel that that's something that can happen on a regular basis. For sure. Getting close to elk, that's what it's all about. Right. right? Being able to get in there with them. And I don't know, I, you know, I, it sounds cliche, -ish, but be one with the elk, right? It's, it's really the real deal. Right. And, and learning their, how they react and act in different winds and, different circumstances, right? It builds your confidence each time you're around that herd and can understand them a little bit more, read their body languages, know what a lead cow is all about, um, know what the bulls are doing when they're bachelored up and then when they start, you know, getting ready. Uh, there's so many things that, like I said, we could talk about, but I think attitude is so important. You know, I had an old coach that coached me in baseball for a long time and he'd call me taco. He'd say, taco. He said, uh, you know, pressure is what you feel when you don't know what you're doing. And you've been pitching a long time. You know exactly what you're doing, right? So there's really no pressure. You know, if this was your first time, I could understand. Well, there's going to be a lot of guys. It's their first time in the elk woods. And the elk bros here could probably help them, right? We can right. probably help them with some of the things that we've done uh, that has messed things up. And some of the things that we've done to be successful that can take them from not having all those heartbreaks and heartaches from where we were to help them being successful. Yeah. You, you got to have confidence, man. For and sure. it, that's going to, that's going to come from, uh, there's no magic wand. No, there ain't, you know, you've had guys in camp. Work that, at it. You've had guys in camp that are really good hunters. They're good shots, but they just get rattled and they, their confidence gets shook. And when they do, man, it's hard to get them back. You know, it's hard to get them feeling good again. You and guys are the best at doing that. But I know some really good guys that kill a lot of animals with their bow. But when you go elk hunting, it's just totally different, you know. And you made a comment to me a long time ago, Joe. You said, hey, when you kill one, the next one will get easier. And when right. you kill two, the next one will get easier. Well, I'm up to six or seven now, and I'm telling you, I, every time I feel like I step in the woods with you or Chav or even just by myself, I feel like I got a really good opportunity of making that happen. But that didn't happen overnight. No. You know, it hap happened with tons of experiences, and tons of mishaps and misfortunes, and tons of, uh, of really good coaching, right? And you guys are two of the best in the business. I wouldn't want to be hooked to the hook my wagon to anybody else in, in the country other than you guys. Well, that's what we live for, man. And, and, you know, when 
I don't know how to do anything other. And, you know, I know you've hunted a lot with Chav the last few years and I've taken a lot of other guys to hunt with me and, and, uh, you know, Chav's been, he's been right behind me for 37 years. Listen to everything I've done. I think he knows, <laughs> I think Shows. he knows more what I'm going to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> so well, man, he can, he can tell me in situations you need to do this or you need to do that. And when we do it, it happens, you know, I, I have had to improvise a little bit in, in a few situations. So, but it's more like, a, he's like, that's exactly what Joe would have done. Right. Yeah. You call like him, you're aggressive like him. And there's a whole lot of things that I picked up from you guys that, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know when you're in the woods, it's just a way of life, you know, well, a way you of know, working things out. I guarantee you this, and this is how I feel about it is that I don't think anybody's going to work any harder than I am. Mm-hmm. I I don't you you can talk to people that job. hunt with us. We hear a bull. Oh, you going, baby. We're going. I mean And hey, Joe Kane here. <laughs> or, <laughs> going. Oh right. Lord and mercy. Yeah. I've, I've talked to some of them boys and they're like, don't tell Joe you hear something. <laughs> We're going to find out. Then boys go, We're going up there. <laughs> <laughs> you know you, you it's all about attitude joe you're it's right. all about attitude man and if if you're going to kill an elk you got to go where the elk are you want to go on a nature hike or you want to go see some elk and uh, you know there there's something that i tell people all the time too that you know guys are so worried about getting called in by other hunters it's like i don't know if it's this embarrassment factor or guy says yeah i called him in or something like that well we have a standing rule in our camp because it's happened too many times. You hear an elk, you check it out. For sure. I, I you know, uh, yeah, you can get in close sometimes and you can tell by the pattern. You can tell this and that and some of the things they do. And you get in there, you can tell. But I can't tell you how many times, you know, you and me have been out there. Yeah, you hear a bugle and you think it may be uh, another hunter. You go anyway because you never know. And all the elk sound a little different, you know, with you know, it sounds like a terrible attempt at calling one. It could be a real elk. Go. No doubt. No doubt. Oh, you know, I think the worst elk call I've ever heard has been from an elk. You know, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, yeah, I'm like, what was that? Right. You know, I've been with you and it sounds real raspy and it's like, that's not an elk. And you're oh. like, oh, yeah, it could be. We better go find out. Oh, we had those ones that sound like a, a cow dying. Yeah. And, and the, know, gra- the growler bulls. It's like, oh, my some, God. Some of those guys have been bugling so much all mm. night long that by the time you get to them in the morning, because a lot of, see, a lot of guys don't understand. You don't know what those elk have done at night sometimes. And, man, they've been just going to a frenzy. You get to in the morning, and he's like, Ee-ee-ee. <laughs> it's right. like oh right. my god that hunter's horrible <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. but fact, it, it boils back to attitude we're gonna go see what that's, everyone that's talking we're gonna talk back and we're gonna go investigate right yeah and you know i i feel like i'm gonna work harder i'm gonna go farther and i'm gonna be the first one on an animal you know I, shoot it's a pretty regular thing that i'm out there couple hours before daylight locating oh, and i know <laughs> for sure <laughs> he had been up since three in the morning they get up i, I done found them I'm like what <laughs> y'all been up since three <laughs> you ain't heard them bugling all morning i'm like hell no i'm trying to recover from that 12 miles we did yesterday <laughs> well that goes right into our next thing though dude yeah, is that sure. you know i think the second area the second focus area of success we said the first one was attitude for sure. Well, I think the second one, and like you said, us being out there early is that you have to create your opportunities. Yeah, for sure. 100%. You know? And uh, so how do you do that? First of all, anybody that's hunt with me, anybody that's been with me at all knows that I'm a super aggressive hunter. For sure. You know, I'm, I'm going to go, uh, I believe in my calling. Now, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily screaming uh, bugles all the time. In fact, one of my early season techniques that I love more than anything is just to move slowly through the feed areas that I know they're at in the morning, 
cow calling and those bulls coming in from the side, you know? So a lot of times just because you don't hear an elk doesn't mean they're not coming in. So that's that's right. That's another important lesson for people to remember about that. So number one is aggressive. I'm aggressive in my calling. Uh, When I do have an animal, I hear that bull, buddy, you better strap it on because we're, (laughs) yeah. Well, I mean, look, at the end of the day, elk are vocal creatures, right? I mean, they're not so shut up all the time. If you've ever been in a herd or around a herd, the cows are talking, the calves are talking, and the bulls for, at some points are, are talking too. But when those cows get to get to uh, to squealing, man, those bulls, and uh, later into September it gets, they get real vocal. But I think a lot of times they get pressured too. And when they get pressured, they shut down. You know, so the opportunities that you create on your feet by being able to understand the area that you hunt and uh, understanding their patterns is huge. You know, not blowing elk out of an area when you have a a secluded area that you're hunting under, you know, wind, wind is the most important thing. I think we, if we could segue into that, I think wind is the most important thing that you have to take into consideration because if you don't play the wind, you ain't never going to see it. And that's going to actually be a podcast in itself for us because, you know, that is so huge. And it, a lot of people don't understand because I've had guys with me, you know, and Chad been with me enough that there's times when I'm walking crosswind and there's a reason elk can smell you but you can smell elk too. For and sure. my first skill set before I knew how to call, before I really understood animals was the first time I smelled an elk, I learned that, man, if I just started working through an area on the sides of those and I caught a whiff of them, I could start hunting into the wind. So, you know, you can use that a lot of ways. I've even had times that I know I want to get to a certain spot and hunt, but I got the wind right at my back. Yep. Well, Well, then go with it at your back. You're not going to see anything in the front, but you can still do some calling. You can get something off the side. Then you can make your plan, get at the same level as that animal, and then start to work that animal, you know, because I've got that that wind going. Now, we'll talk about wind and thermals and all that in a a podcast in itself, but you're exactly right about that. Uh, I think for creating your opportunities, I think probably the one thing that really changed everything for me was being able to speak the language, being able to, to call, understanding the different sounds, right. You know, and, and talking to the animals. I mean, of the, of the animals I've killed, I've called every animal in that I've killed for myself. So basically been a solo hunter. Now it's awesome like when I can put Chab up in front of me and, or put you Gilbert up in front and I do the calling in the back and bring them by you, that that's primo. But if you don't have other people in camp that call and basically it's been us these years and you know, he, he picked up a, a diaphragm this won't. year. And <laughs> oh, awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So before that, yeah, the guys used to call him, you know, Hoochie Mama because he had, you know, and a lot of elk killed with a Hoochie Mama. That's right. right. That's right. right. Yeah, for sure. Right. But I can tell you, being able to talk to them, being able to, you know, throw your own party, to be able to sound like a herd bull moving with a herd, you know, there's a lot of advantages to that and that help you to create your own opportunities. Yeah. That's when it, that, and those things changed for me when you taught me how to do that. Right. And then I worked at it myself a a tremendous, and I still have a lot of work to do, but there is not a time that I feel like I'm in the woods with Chav or even just by myself that I can't, I can't make one of them react to me. Right. I I really feel like I can, I can speak to them. I can get the cows moving. I can speak to that bull. I mean, I've called several bulls in, we, you and I both have worked together to call chaps and bulls. And it's been, and when you can get two guys calling at the same time, making it sound like a herd that's around, whoo, that is powerful stuff. Well, especially and, uh, early season. For you sure. Know, for sure. Uh, you've got it going on early season. What's happening early season, uh, and again, that's probably another podcast, but you've got those big bulls that are actually shadowing, they're reserving their energy. The yeah. small bulls have herded everything up and they're like, oh, yeah, go ahead, man. You know, when time's right, I'll 
I'll, I'm I'll fix that carve situation. me out a piece for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a that's a big part of it right there. Being able to speak the language, understanding, you know that, and you're gonna make some mistakes. Oh you know? yeah. But that's part learning. of it, man. That's mm-hmm. that's part of the learning, and uh, you know that I I think that's real real key as much as understanding. You know, we talking right now. We're we're all three bow hunters. You know. Yeah. And uh, I know you've taken a lot of guys muzzle loader, and you've taken sure. a lot of guys rifle, and I guide guys during that. And you know, during that that time when we go in September, those elk have a priority. You know, sure. their their priority yeah. is going to be, you know, yeah. rut. Right. It's going to be food, and it's going to be water. Those are their priorities. And you know, uh, uh, reproducing is number one. You know that's on their list. That's what they've been building everything up for. They've Mm -hmm. been feeding all summer long, getting those energy reserves. So if you understand those priorities and you use those as your advantage, then you can make some things happen as well. You know, I think it's awesome to hunt up in those beautiful pines and that high alpine and stuff like that. But that has its pros and cons. You know, mm-hmm. if if I've got a year over here and, and we're hunting New Mexico, uh, we've never hunted anything but New Mexico. Hunting with you on your on your ranch hunting for pigs here in in in, in, in April. a few weeks. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to that. That's gonna yeah, be that, awesome, man. That's gonna be the first time we have ever hunted out of New Mexico. Oh, I can't wait. It's gonna be you awesome. Know? It's gonna so, be awesome. You know, when we're here and we start looking before the season, we're looking for that food source, man. If acorns are out, I know that those guys are going to be in that scrub oak heavy. Oh, for sure. And, and it's ugly. It's hot. Yep. It's scratchy. You know, you get beat up. The rocks are tough. Oof, oof. But Tough sled. Yep. But, man, I tell you what. The elk are there. And when you get a shot. Yeah, it's, it's right at you. It's right there. You're taking advantage of that. You're taking advantage of their food source. You know, if we got a lot of rain, well, water ain't going to be high on their list. But here in New Mexico, when it's hot and dry, got to you know, have water. They got to get to that water. So you want to take those things to create your opportunities. You got to change your game plan. You have to change. With, you know, I think coaching. The first thing you taught me is if you know, if something's not working you don't keep doing the same thing to get the same a different result, result man. Right. It's the definition of insanity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the thing that you want to do is you've got to think about everything and, and uh, learn about those animals and create your opportunities. And that, that's the one thing that we're doing with the blue collar elk Academy is we want to give that information to people because when, when we're out there and we're trying to find an animal, we're taking in all this information because it's in our database. For so sure. what, what we need to do is we need to help other people to build up their database so that they can understand those situations and be more successful in them as well. Joe, let me ask you one question to, to you know, even with you creating your own opportunities, how much of that really depends on the area you're hunting, Joe? As far as? As far as the opportunities, if we're hunting in an area that ain't got any elk, it's going to be really hard to create an opportunity. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, so no. You're... For, 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 the, for the elk Joes that are out there, right, the blue right. collar guys that want to know, you know, hey, uh, where, where should I start looking? Right. Right. Uh, what are some of the hot areas to look in? Uh, I think that's a whole podcast in itself where you could talk about some places in New Mexico to go and, uh, and, and how do, to find elk and where yeah, you should be D, looking D, for those elk. Yeah. DYI right. and state lands and right. BLM stuff. I mean, all of that, but yeah, you got to be around them. You know? Right. And and I think that comes into, that's another, like you said, another podcast that comes into pre-scouting. Right. Well, you know, yeah, it is pre-strategy, but it's also doing your homework, you know, talking to the right people and, and, uh, and even talking, you know, game wardens and stuff like that. But I like to find out from ranchers, you know, those guys that, you know, during the winter time, have got those elk out there wintering on their place because they've come down to those low areas. They're feed, feed, feeding, you know, or For they're sure. up on the slopes. You know, where you're seeing animals in the winter time is not where you're going to see them during oh, the yeah. bow season. 
you know there's a there's a lot of difference for why and where they're going to be but it does give you an idea of a range that they're in because here in New Mexico we're not Wyoming or or Montana where they they travel this huge migration route you know we have animals that oh they might you know they might move probably 10 15 miles uh from one location to another but they kind of get habitual about that and right. you, you know when you call me before the season we go out and you say well you guys been scouting out there yeah. you know, we're not out looking for elk we're out there checking the feed for sure to see what's happening if we have an acorn crop or something like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um we're looking for the cow elk mm -hmm. you know because we're going to be bow hunting we're, we don't need to know where the bull elk are during that time of year we need to know the cows where the cows the are because cows, yeah, yeah. you find them you're going to find the bulls that's exactly right they're going to show up you know for sure it's For like, sure. uh, it's how it works. That, that leads you into, you know, what's the most important thing, Joe, when you're looking at, at a piece of property, you know, uh, is it, you know, if we're going to have a, a warm, a warm start to our bow season, is it those upper elevations where those elk are going to be right? Um, a lot of guys would, they don't want to get very far off the beaten trail. And that's what we right. love. We love everybody to stay down there in that bottom country and stuff like right. that and stay out of our way into the tougher stuff. But uh, those well, I've seen, and, and you're testament to that. You've been with me on that when sure. guys will do just the opposite, man. They feel like, oh, I'm camped here. So I've got to drive 15 miles <laughs> to be able to hunt elk. Yeah. And, and we killed, or we killed two elk should have had three, not a half mile from where everybody was camping. You know, sure. sometimes they leave elk to go find elk, you know, and uh, that's kind of a cardinal sin, you know, I fish professionally for many years. And that was the cardinal sin. You don't leave fish to find fish. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when you find them, they're there for a reason. Right. Just right. keep working. And I think a lot of guys get flustered on public land hunts because of people, you know, well, those people got to seal the deal just like you do. And they got to hunt everything else up uh, and, and God bless them. But d don't let that discourage you, you know, right. it, th there are people there because, man, the elk can be there one day and not there the next. And those guys will drive right by them. Watch that several times, huh, Chad? Right. So yeah. on that one year, you got that, that, uh, the big bull of yours, you know, we'd get up in the morning and, and drive down and we get passed by 30 hunters on four wheelers going the opposite way. So For yeah, sure. yeah, you never know. And right. What a deal. I mean, Joe's pushing them the whole time from four miles away. Right. right. He's pushing, he's pushing <laughs> the herd. And how did we know that was Joe doing that? Right. The herd's coming right at us. I mean, that's just one of those crazy things that happened, but we put ourselves, we created the opportunity by putting ourselves in the right position. You know, there's lots of acorns down there that year. We knew that we could hear bulls bugling in the morning. Some days they beat us going up. Some days they didn't. But that particular day, it was magical. I mean, you, anytime you call nine bulls in in one sit, I mean, it's just nuts. Well, that's, you know, one of my favorite things to do is, I don't know how many times, I, I if I had a nickel for every time I've talked to a hunter and they say, well, they're just not bugling, you know. For sure. And so we're not going to get anything. Uh one of my favorite things to do is, well, man, if the bull ain't bugling there, then I guess I'm going to have to be the bull. And I'll, I'll start doing the exact same things they are. I right. start moving up a ridge with that wind hitting me, you know, using that, using the thermals, moving up into it and sounding like a bull with a herd of cows. And you get those satellite bulls to come in from the side. So sometimes if you can't find the party, you got to create your own party. Exactly. So when that, and that goes into being able to speak the language, you know, right? That, that creates opportunity. That's exactly right. Creating opportunities, you know, to just sometimes think out of the box and tell yourself, you know, why is it that that herd bull is screaming the whole time he's moving up that ridge? You know, he's letting those cows know where he is, you know, because mm -hmm. they're moving through those trees. He's being dominant, you know, and so there's things that you can do to actually mimic that. I, I tell you one time, do you remember that time I, I shot a bull, Chab and I got in a group of a big herd. And uh, I mean, we were right in amongst them. We were working and we had these real low jack pines, this real thick, dark cover. And uh, 
as we're going, Chav catches some animals going off to one side and he splits off from me and I keep going at this one. Well, I end up shooting a really nice bull at God, I don't know, 10 yards, eight yards. And when the bull was down, I wanted to let Chav know that uh, I had a bull down and, and so he could locate me and come help me and pack it out for me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Yeah, you for sure. For and, sure. Uh, so I have a distinct type of bugle that I do that so he can recognize it's me. It's a little double bugle. So I kind of go up with a scream and as I'm coming down, I go right back with another scream and it sounds like one bull answering another. So I sat there and just started berserk, dude. I mean, I was like, just scream and double bugle, scream, double, double bugle, another one, another one, just nonstop. Cause I'm like, Chav, come on, man. It's me. Come over and help me out. Right. Right. Before he got to me, I called in four separate bulls. Yeah. You know, that, that was an aha mo moment mm -hmm. right there, you mm -hmm. know? So creating your own opportunities. That's uh that's focus area. Number two. For sure. And, uh, Let's go into the last one that I, that I think, bud. And, and it's the hardest one, right? Closing the deal. Yeah, for sure. I mean, number three, be closing the deal. Uh, and I think that's one of the hardest one that guys struggle with, man. You know, I did. Uh, I mean, look, I'm a very accomplished bow hunter. I've killed lots of whitetails and pigs, meal guy. I mean, you name it. But when it comes to elk, it's just a different deal. Closing the deal is not that easy. Right. Guy, guys will, Man, I, guys spend hours upon hours, weeks and months practicing. But the anatomy of an elk is totally different than just about any creature you'll hunt. And uh, when you understand their anatomy and what makes them work and how to seal the deal. That's critical too. 100% critical. And I think for me, the most important part of the whole thing is you got to draw. You got to draw your bow. If right. you don't draw your bow, you're never going to be able to seal the deal. I can't tell you how many guys I've seen not get an opportunity because they, and I see it in whitetail hunting too, right? We just never drew. And it's like, what did you, what were you waiting for? Right. right. So, and I'm sure you say, I know you've seen it. I know Chav, you've seen it. You know, I, I watched a bull almost step on Chav and I'm going, I called the bull in. I watched him almost step on Chav. And the bull slightly turned, gave Chad the, the perfect opportunity to draw. He drew. I covered his draw with a little, uh, a little scream. The bull actually looks right over. And Chad's down below him. He actually looks right over him. But, again, we created the opportunity by speaking the language, got him to come, and then Chav sealed the deal, drawing the bow back. And, and once he got it back, it was Katie Barr. The elk was in serious trouble. You know, right. But again, had we not have put those little things together, we'd have never got that opportunity. Well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons. For, I mean, because there's a lot of guys, I would say just about a high, high percentage of hunters, bow hunters out there. Um, when they get out there, they have opportunities, but they don't know how to See set that up. opportunity up into so they can make a, a good clean kill. And uh, I've had a, yeah, I mean, I agree. It, there's a lot of people stumble into an animal for sure. Uh, but, you know, to be consistently putting yourself in position to ensure that you can make a good clean kill, there's a few things that I tell people if they're going to be able to close a deal. Number one is you have to move. If you're in a situation, where that animal's coming and you're not in a, in a good shooting position, you have to move. And I, I talked to guys, I said, why didn't you get into a better shooting position? And they're like, well, I didn't want to spook him. And I'm like, well, okay, so let's take a look at the math here, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> you don't move. You're locked up into a bunch of trees. The bull's going to do what? Yeah, he's, yeah, uh, he's, he's going to he walk off. Forward. He's gone, man. Okay. And, you know, if, if you try to get in position, there's two things going to happen. Either you're going to get in position so you can have a shot. That's the plus side. Or you're going to spook him and he's going to run off. 
same result as before. So I'd rather put myself in better position. Well, so. and, and there's a, a plus side to the, to the second part you talked about. If you're with a guy that's got a little snap like yourself or Chav or myself, when you do move, I'm going to cover you. Right. So even if the bull does booger nine, 90% of the time when they booger, if you cow call or bugle, they're going to stop right within 20 yards. Right. right. So, well, a lot I mean, of times you're not in shooting position when that happens, but you know, sure. you're, you're, you're sitting there going, ah, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but, but what you're talking about Gilbert is, is when somebody's in actual shooting position yeah. and they have a bull coming by and, you know, it's different for me than it is for you and Chab because you guys shoot those bows now that have that 80% let off, you know, right. Right. and, and I'm shooting something with 35% let off shooting fingers, no pins. So I have to really think differently when an animal's coming into shooting position. And what I've told people is, you know, the best time to draw on that animal is when they're moving because when they're moving everything's moving everything's moving right and you know i could not count the times man early on when i first started hunting i'm like okay i'm gonna wait for his head to go behind that tree right there (laughs) you know and i start that draw and his head pops out on the other side and catches that last little movement of mine and what does he do stops with his vitals in the tree eggs right perfectly you know his head and he's sitting there looking at you and you got a tree right through the vitals and you're at full draw and you're going january february march (laughs) you've got to let down you know so i tell people man if you have you know like you guys with the with 80 percent let off and you see an animal getting coming even thinking about being in range man you're you're back and you're ready to go Well, if you're not in that situation, you didn't have that, and that animal's coming across, I would rather that animal clear any obstacle before I draw. And now that animal's going to do the same thing. He's going to stop, and he's going to look at me, and and we're letting go. Mm -hmm. Or that animal's going to booger, and he's going to stop to see, oh, man, was that that an elk that just spooked me? For sure. First bull I ever killed in my life was with Joe Gilly. Um, same thing happened. Bull's coming to us. Joe's like, look, I'm going to stop him. When I stop him, you're going to draw at the same time. I'm going to cover the draw with you. He said, when you get, when he gets here to that opening, I'm going to be, I'm going to cow call. And when I do draw, I'll never forget it. As soon as I heard him go, I drew the bull stopped and looked in where we're at. And he had no clue. Ah, It was a fatal deal for him. Right. But we sealed the deal, you know, made a good shot and the rest was history. But it, because of all of that experience had I, and I'm telling you, there was part of me that didn't want to draw. There was part of me that did not want to draw. I felt like he was going to blow up and run off the whole nine yards. But because you had enough snap and knew that if you cow call, he's going to stop and go, ah, what was that? And he's right. walking me drawing. It's not going to be a big deal. You know? Um, yeah. I, I think, Sealing the deal is probably one of the hardest parts, you know, having a great attitude, being involved in creating opportunities. And then once you get the opportunity, you got to make it happen. Well, it goes back to that same attitude of aggressiveness. You know, I'm going to move. I'm going to put myself in the best position I can to have the best shooting lanes. Hopefully I've had the opportunity to do that before the animal came in, you know, uh, a lot of times being a solo hunter, I have to work a bull. And, and that's one thing I love to do with my calls and my grunt tube. And I'll aim it, aim it behind me and I'll mm-hmm. actually direct that bull a certain direction to bring him by. So that's something that I've learned over the years to be able to do that. A lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll cow call and the cow call forward. And that animal, man, it's like all of a sudden, well, that cow's right there. And he's stopping, he's looking and, and you've just locked him up and he's going to stay out of range. So that's yeah. just one of the little tips or tricks right there as well. And, and, and because you showed me how to do that this past season, Chav and I actually had six bulls within 12 feet of us. And I actually bugled several times, but behind me, because the bulls would act like they didn't want to come any closer. 
So I'd bugle the opposite direction and that would just incense them. They were like, what the world? I don't see him. And he, they would come back. Right. Right. But several times they acted like they wanted to go. But if I would have called out to them, I guarantee you it would have freaked them out. Right. But I really softly bugled behind me with the tube and then threw a few cow calls that in that direction. That made a huge difference. And finally got a couple of them to commit and, uh, and sealed the deal. It don't always work, but you know, hopefully, cause we're, we like to hunt those early part of the season, yeah. you know, some of those guys that uh, are not as bright as some of those older bulls and <laughs> for sure. You know, yeah. yeah well, I, well, I, I didn't say it was an old bull that I killed. <laughs> I just said, you know, hey, the, man, older, if, the older one was like, man, something ain't right around here. Well, that's yeah. the ones we're looking for. The ones that want to make the mistake. Right. So sure, that, sure. that's I, happening. I'm, just like that. I'm an opportunistic elk hunter now. <laughs> you create yeah. your opportunity yeah, and then you, on you finish. You got to make sure you finish, you know, for and sure. I think the other thing I tell guys are too, is, you know if you've really done your homework and again let me go back to confidence let me go back to attitude there is no magic wand you got to work at it you got to shoot you got to you got to get in physical condition you got to do the things that are going to help you to be successful can you go out there not in great shape and kill an elk yes you can but your opportunities are going to be so much more limited Limited, right So that, that's something that I, that I make sure I tell people. And, you know, the last thing I tell them is, is if you understand what your killing shot is, you know, if you understand uh, that animal's anatomy and you have the shot and it is a shot that you're comfortable with, it's your range shot, it's a shot that's going to be a killing shot, you got to shoot. You know, don't sit there and think about it all day get back, find your spot, understand what you're doing and make a good solid shot on that animal. So you got to move, you got to draw. And if you got that good shot, you got to take that shot. Your own, your window don't last very long. For sure. Joe, what do you think the, the, in the thought process on a, on a young hunter, a guy that's just started out elk hunting, would you put a limit on the distance that he shoots would you, would you rein him in 30 yards and in, or would you rein him in 40 yards and in, even though the guy can tap a target out to 50, 60 yards really doesn't mean that he can make a killing shot at those distances. Shooting at live animals are way different than shooting a target. You know, I am not the judge for anybody out there. I, you know, I, I, I am not able to tell people, you know, you can only shoot 20 and under, you can only shoot 30 right, and under, right, right. you know, that person has to understand and honor that animal, honor the hunt and take the best responsible ethical shot that they can within their abilities. If that's a 60 yard shot, you know, then, and they can make that solid. The only thing I would tell them is a lot of things can happen from the time it takes from that arrow release to when it gets there. And, uh, you know, and the further that distance is the greater that opportunity is. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because, you know, the, the best shot out there is a quartering away shot. Right? For sure. For sure. Okay. I'll agree. And I mean, that quartering away shot, I'm able to do that, but let's say I've got an animal quartering away at 60, 65 yards. And I take that shot and that animal hear something or senses something or hears a when it when that yeah. happens and he turns just oh, a little yeah. bit now that quartering away turns into a butt shot right, right. For sure. whereas now you take it they're just the opposite i've got that animal quartering to me a little bit like that yeah. Yeah. and i go ahead and do the same thing and take that shot and hear something and that animal starts to turn now he's turned into a broadside animal there you know mm. so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, a good looking shot at a far distance can become a bad shot and stuff can happen there. So, yeah, yeah, and I think you got to read the body language of the elk too, you know, if he's really on alert, if he's staring you down, I mean, that's probably a shot that you want to just not take if it's marginal. Right. Right. Uh, but, but if he's out there feeding or he's herding cows and he doesn't even have any idea that you're there, that's right. probably something that you can get away with. It. But I think a, a lot of that sealing the deal, man, is really about angles, really understanding the anatomy of the elk 
and understand for me, us Texas bow hunters, and I'm lumping us all in there together. We're so focused on the shoulder, right? We blow through two shoulders of a white tail and it's a, it's a done deal for me. I, I done been around the shoulder of an elk I, and I've butchered many of them. You don't want to be nowhere near the shoulder of that elk for me, yeah. right? For right. me, I want to be behind the crease, man. I, and I mean, I have shot them as, that much behind the crease and killed them stone graveyard dead. Well, especially if you have a quartering away animal because you're aiming sure. at that leg on the opposite side. And for, sure. for anybody that's out there listening, when when you have an, an animal and, and they are, you can tell if they're quartering to you, quartering away, right, Chad? Just by, just by, leg. Just by yeah. looking at that opposite leg right there. And so sure. when that animal is quartering away, you're not aiming at the the, the leg crease. on your side. Right. You're aiming for that opposite leg. And for it sure. might look like you're shooting way back on that animal, but that's how you have to shoot yeah, I mean, that I because tell, it's I the tell angle guys, that takes it through. For sure. I tell guys all the time, take your pin up the off leg. And right. when it gets to the center, I like a little bit higher than center mast because if I'm, a, if I'm a little, if I miss my distance just a little bit, I'm going to hit him right in the pocket. If I'm just a little high, it's really not going to matter. I'm going to hit them high lungs. And he's going to run a little bit, but not too far. I mean, well, and, and I'm, I'm just a little bit the opposite on that, that I like it just a little bit lower than that center mass, uh, like that lower third. And, and the reason is, is, you know, sometimes you're going to miss. And sure. if you, if you shoot low um, and you're at that lower third, then that's the best shot you could have taken because that animal is moving off. You shoot a little bit high. Well, now you're not shooting up there in that no man's land because yeah. a lot of people don't realize how much that spine comes down sometimes on there. A so, lot, yeah. You sure. know, you, you just got to understand that anatomy and you got to do what you're comfortable with and make sure that you're making the, the, the best solid shot you can. So, right. uh, I, but would I think, you would you agree you got a lot more room behind the shoulder than most oh, people think? Yeah, more I mean, than they think they do, you know, sure. because a lot of guys don't understand how that, you know, if if you look at where that elbow is, that that shoulder, that leg bone goes up Easy inside out, the front of the animal and then hits that shoulder blade coming back. Right. So you have a little pocket in there, and that's where the heart is, and that's that's the best pocket. I I actually like to be about three inches behind on that because I'm like you, man. Uh, uh, I shoot fingers. I don't shoot release, yeah. and uh, I'm pretty solid uh, sure. as, as a shot. For sure. Uh, but if, if I end up pulling something and it goes off to the right, I don't want to be smacking into that shoulder bone, you know? No, and, and, and for me, man, I, I, this year I shot a bull at like 57 yards with Chad and it was real low light conditions. But when I settled, I, I knew the, I put my 60 yard pin where it needed to go. He was slightly downhill too. So I knew that I was going to be right on the money when I cut it loose. But I guarantee you, I was eight, nine inches behind that shoulder. Right. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, uh, but I'm comfortable with that shot. He was quartering just a little bit when I touched it off, but he hit him perfect. And, and when that, when the arrow w went through him, it went through him and it went 60 yards past him. Right. Right. And, right. and he died within, I don't know what, 40 yards from where we shot him. I mean, it was, it was amazing but if I was just a little bit left, you know, if I pulled it just a little bit, I'd have hit him right in the crease, you right. know, and right. that would have been perfect. And if I'm just a little bit right, I got probably the last part of lungs and liver. So you know? the, the, the point that you bring up, Gilbert, that I like to tell everybody, you know, because we, where I guide professionally, they have a, they have a, a, a no mechanical rule there. And uh, some of the guys ask about that. And, uh, and, and I just tell them th this, you know, and I tell them, you know, where I want them to shoot as well. And, and our goal is not one hole, two holes. For you know, sure, I want two yes. holes. If I have two holes, you know, it's going to make my trailing that much better. That animal is going to go down sooner, you know, than him uh, having an arrow sticking in him and, and, uh, and, and something happening crazy there with it sealing up or something. I, I want two holes. So, For sure. uh, you know, I, I think that's, the three things on, on this podcast that we're going to talk about here is that uh, we want to make sure, you know, 
the three things that I say help people to be more successful is the attitude they have going into the woods, attitude and confidence, the ability to create their own opportunities. And then finally, man, is just that, that knowledge factor and, and uh, the ability to close the deal, doing those right things, that situation, instead of, you know, ended up walking yourself up behind where you're not going to have a shot or you don't draw and uh, putting yourself in a bad position. So uh, that that's pretty much for, for this time. So in closing, this is exactly what I think the guys out there in, in elk country are going to want to hear, right? Real guys talking about real problems or real situations when we're going out there elk hunting. There's going to be a lot of shows out there that talk about elk hunting. We're going to get down to the brass tacks of how things really work when you're doing things yourself, right? And, uh, and when you're out there in the woods and when you come upon something, you'd be able to say, man, I heard about that on Elk Bros, you know, this past week. Those guys were talking about, you know, this very thing, you know. Instead of me, you know, getting behind cover, I need to be in front of cover, right? right. I mean, those little bitty things help guys so much, you know. Um, and, and I'd tell guys, you know, watch as much as you can digest everything you can out there yeah. go out there and man you know, listen to Corey jacobson and 101 go out there and uh born and raised those fellas i, I just I'm love right. watching those guys too listen to as much as you can out there and and digest that there's you can never listen or learn enough every For time sure. i go in the woods every mm -hmm. time we go out there we learn something an experience every time yeah yeah, you know, the, and that's what we. I mean, I kind of, I kind of, it's kind of cliches, but you hunt for the experiences, you know. And and when you find them, it's like gold, you know. You put them in that in that memory bank, and us having this group uh, chat for what it may be or podcast, it, it's releasing that gold, right? Keeping it live because we're not going to be on the face of the earth every day, right? We've right. lost some of our compadres already, you know. Um, and and I'm telling you, this knowledge is power. You know. And well, it, it when you start when you start counting seasons, when you start thinking about it that way, you yeah. know, you know those seasons, man. They you start clipping into them. So, you know, sure. uh, you only have so many seasons in a lifetime, and you know, uh, learn what you can, enjoy, and and uh, you know, I, it, it's 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 funny. I tell my wife it's the hardest work I've ever done yeah. out there. It, oh my and, gosh. But I I'm love so it. I'm so sore every time I come. It, but if you man, I can't. I, I I start counting the days. Is I tell everybody it's like heaven when you get there and hell when you leave. Because I mean, <laughs> it, right. it's it's straight up the most. It's the it's the it's. I have more fun doing that than I do anything. I'd rather. I want to be one day be able to take off the whole month of September and October and just go elk hunting and all the states in the union that you can go elk hunting in. I mean, uh, New Mexico's awesome. I'm sure Nevada's got some good hunting and Utah and Arizona. And I mean, I don't know. I just, I love doing it. And, uh, I love calling elk. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoy being with you guys in elk camp and the camaraderie. And I don't know, I'm, I'd much rather get, get that out of, out of hunting and get it out of a bottle or out of a syringe or something like that. Oh, no kidding, man. Yeah. So what we want to do is, um, we want to continue to invite everybody out there to come into our elk camp, into our little private group sure. that we have here right now with, that we're making public. For sure. And uh, we hope you uh, enjoy what we're giving you. Um, you know, we're just, uh, we're just regular blue collar guys that been out there and uh, doing it the hard way, um, learning the hard way, doing a lot of things. And I can tell you this, it, whatever you, we know, we're going to give to you. So, and, and, and I can echo that for sure. I've been hunting these guys for a long time. I want to thank you, Joe. I want to thank you, Chav, for being with us tonight. Thank everybody out there in, in uh, the cyber world who will get to, to view this uh, podcast and uh, understand that Elk Bros is a work in progress. And we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, you can check us out on the web and, uh, you know, we look forward to having all comments, whether they're good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter. But if it's ugly, keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see everybody next time, man. Right. Bet.
H-Town out.